Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Chasing Billy. Today, author and historian James B. Mills joins me for a chat about his book, Billy the Kid, El Bandito Simpatico, along with his upcoming projects, and generally just about anything we could think of about Billy the Kid. I uh, hope to have him back for more conversations. It was a great experience, and I hope you enjoy the show. At least somebody will <laughs> keep it alive. Um, cool. Well, uh, today we have James B. Mills, noted author of Billy the Kid, El Bandito Simpatico, and a frequent uh, contributor to Wild West Publications and Historical Publications. James, thanks for joining me. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself and what got you into all this. Oh, geez, man, that all started when I was a little kid just watching the westerns, and you know, I caught Young Guns two on television one night, and I was like, "Wow, that guy's really cool and really funny." So, hit the video store and rented the first one, and I was just hooked. And must have watched both those films at least fifty times each when I was nine, ten, eleven years old. So, I could recite them from start to finish, all the dialogue. And stuff. But yeah, I was reading about. Yeah. American West history when I was six, seven years old. It just progressed from there. Do you like Young Guns 2 better than the first one? Hell no. Do you not? <laughs> Hell no. No, the first one's way better. Way better. Well, I'm still I'm still in the minority there. I guess I saw Young Guns 2 first, and that was really what grabbed me. And uh, I'm still just a, a, a fan of the second one more than the first. But I think objectively... You and, and the other folks who like the first one are correct, but it's just a nostalgia thing for me. I'm just hooked on the on the second one. <laughs> but, I saw the, uh, I, the man, second one first as well, but yeah. yeah, I just think the first one's the better film, way better film, in my opinion, but hey, man, it's all subjective. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what, what made you do the leap from, I mean, you're – you're an established author now. You uh, are a historian. What made you, what motivated you to make the leap from a fan of, of the legend and the movies to actually writing and and being a historian and, and getting the record straight and releasing books and writing articles? Well, I was always interested in writing. Uh, mm -hmm. From the time I was a kid, I had an electric typewriter when I was like nine years old. So I was always interested in that. I can't really pinpoint a precise moment where it was like a light bulb going off, like, hey, this is what I'm going to do. It just kind of happened. I just all started. My first ever article that I wrote was one about, actually about rain in the face, the Lakota warrior. So it had nothing to do with Bonnie. And uh, that got picked up by True West and just progressed from there. But I'd yeah. always wanted to write about, I'd always wanted to write about Bonnie, but. I was kind of, you know, how do I really approach it from an angle that I could enjoy doing and something a little different? And I thought, well, the Espana side of things might work for me. I think it has. Yeah, I think that's a great con contribution. And that kind of angle is something that I think has been overlooked a lot in the past, uh, especially given his, you know, he, he was a friend more to the hispano uh crowd than he was to the anglo crowd back then and his ability to speak fluent spanish and and you know hide out among the people and that kind of thing uh really endeared him to the what they would call the native population um and i think it is a good angle um do, so you know i'm sure when you put out a book on billy the kid you heard many times you know, why do we need another Billy book? And you've got, you know, Utley and, and Nolan and all these guys who put out these Billy biographies. So what was your take on, on what you could contribute to the field? Uh, I know mainly it was the, the Hispano influence and, and that kind of angle. Was there anything else that you thought, Hey, here's a new perspective I can bring to the situation. And, um, kind of like set yourself apart or or give as a reason for why you think the world 
or at least this small facet of the, of the world needed a new approach or a new uh, comprehensive uh, book? Uh, I, my part of my goal was to just I don't know where this idea came from that my book would tell like the Hispano side of the Lincoln County War and all that. Mm. Because this next book I'm working on will as much as is possible. My ambition with it, as I stated in the preface, was to just give the Hispanos their rightful voice and place in his history. Uh, and I feel that I pulled that off. Um, I just wanted to really get to the core or as close as possible to the core of the, the flesh and blood human being that was free of any and all mythos. And I mean, you mentioned Art B and, and Nolan, I mean, they both did good, great work in their time, but I mean, historiography is a process. We're always learning new things. I mean, we didn't know until you know a few months ago when you published your article about James W. Bell, that Bell was a fugitive when body shot him. He'd been charged with murder in Texas. So, you know, it's always a, the progression and history usually needs updating now and then. And so I guess that was an aim of mine, just to give the Espanos their rightful, rightful voice and to also, I think, give their recollections the due attention that they deserve, which they didn't always receive. They definitely didn't always receive. And I guess that's why... I, <laughs> Spent 18 months sleepless, you know, right, writing the thing. I'm pretty tired now. I might fall, I might fall asleep right here in this chair. If I doze off, I'll have to shout something at me. Wait, you know. Um, we yeah, probably, you know, we should probably warn warn the listeners that with me on here, uh, that this podcast, particular one, is being rated FBHL, which is F bombs <laughs> highly likely. No, oh, I'm a I'm a big fan of the book. I think I think your book is the the most comprehensive uh, book out there that's been put out in our generation. But also, in my opinion, it's the most easily readable and well written one. Uh, and, and the thing about I, th I think that's what I appreciate about you is that you're a writer as well as a historian. So I think being a historian who publishes books you need to have a talent at writing and presenting documented history. And uh, in my opinion, you know, I love Utley and Nolan and, and all those guys, but I, in my opinion, they're incredibly dry and they're not page turners and they don't, if you're coming to Billy the kid wanting information and you're, you know, you haven't spent years in the field and you don't really know what you're looking for. And, you just need a comprehensive narrative of the whole thing. In my opinion, your book is the top for that. It's extremely well written, and it's the only Billy biography I've ever read that I wanted to keep reading and didn't want to put down. And it was, uh, you know, to use the popular phrase for, you know, a lot of these modern novelists and things, it was a page turner. Uh, and, and it was, well, I loved it. I still remember passages and chapters from it. So, uh, I say kudos to you for that. I think you did a great job presenting the material, making it incredibly readable. And so I like to tell people it's the most comprehensive book on Billy. If you're looking to learn the whole story in one volume and are looking for a resource on that, it's one, uh, it's, you know, probably the best out there for that, in my opinion. Oh, thanks, man. You're going to make me blush here. Uh, well, you put me I in the liner notes, so... Hey? I... <laughs> I said you put what? me in the liner notes, so I have to say good things about it, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, well, you deserve to be in the liner notes, man. So, but there was a lot of people. I know. Uh, you You know, living in Australia, you had to work with folks, I'm sure, in, in certain libraries and collections... Who did you find that you had an easy to go of it with these libraries and these collections when you were gathering material? Were they easy to deal with? Were some harder to deal with than others? Yeah, mostly, except when I want a couple of them tried to charge me reproduction fees for public domain photos. 
they got told to really? shut that. Um, well, uh, but no, I had some, some nice help. I, uh, this book I'm, I finished, actually. I finished the other night, the next book. Oh, uh, wow. Congratulations, well, man. Oh, we'll get into that later, man. But, like, an archivist uh, in Santa Fe will be the first name mentioned in the liner notes in the, and in the acknowledgements because she's just been tremendous help for me in just acquiring anything I wanted. But I had, I had good people. Uh, lovely lady Kathy Smith at Paley Memorial Library, and a bunch of others. So, but as for me, like being Australian, man, you know what you you think I forgot? It's <laughs> it's hard for me. It's hard for me to forget that because I get reminded of it by someone like you know every week. Oh, you're an Australian. And I'm like, yes, I am, you know. And I I think it's funny when people say, well, yeah, you haven't travelled to New Mexico or whatever. Yeah, there's a fucking reason for that. It's a medical condition <laughs> that prevents me from traveling. So, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, it is what it is, man. Well, I mean, but that's the thing. I I live in West Virginia, and and that is just <clears throat> well, for I'm... all intents, <clears throat> yeah, for all intents and purposes, that's just as removed from Lincoln, New Mexico, as Australia. And it, this idea. And I know that you and I have both spoken with people who, you know, have had boots on the ground, who their presence on the sacred land does not make them any more, uh, you know, eligible for inheritance of some sacred birthright of historical knowledge than anyone else. And the idea that the idea that geographical proximity to, you know, your history subject makes you somehow more an authority on the source it just blows my mind. And I'm sure you get a lot of that, uh, a lot of that. Well, you're in Australia, so you don't know about New Mexico. Well, I'm in West Virginia. So does that make anything I've written that is true, uh, unacceptable or not <laughs> permissible in the court of public opinion? <laughs> Obviously it's nice to visit places. I've visited yeah. some in the past, have visited some historical sites in here in Australia. And it was nice to get a feel for the place. But I did not develop a deeper, meaningful understanding of what it was like to be there 140 years ago. And, you know, I appreciate the boots on the ground. That's good stuff. And believe me, if I was capable of doing it, I would have, I would have left Australia 10 years ago. And gone, well, but this, I, the whole concept of feeling history coming up through your feet the soles of your feet and feeling it in your, like, what, what do you drop an acid at the time? You know, like you get serious. You, there's not, there's no ghosts there or shit like that to, you know, you can go and walk on the beach at Normandy today. You can go do that. It's not going to give you anyone a better understanding what it was like to actually be there when the Germans opened fire. And as far right. as, to me, it's kind of like, well, I had one guy tell me that you can't write about Western history unless you've ever fired a Colt revolver. I'm like, yeah. it's fucking, this obvious <laughs> fucking idiot. I, I said, I said, so if I ever write about the Titanic, do I need to have been on a sinking ship? Like, <laughs> fuck, man. Yeah. And I would think you would, you would not just have to fire a revolver, but be in a gunfight. I would imagine to get oh, the adrenaline. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was, and, the guy and, that actually, that was the guy that threatened to shoot me over the Django article. So we'll talk the about same that. guy. Yeah. Well, I will say, you know, I I went to Lincoln, and it it was what I deem a spiritual experience. But when I say spiritual, I just mean non material. To to be there, and I think for me, the reason things like that are spiritual is because, and I know you would feel this too, because as a historian, you realize this is the place where all the things that you've invested your time in and your energies and, and that you, that interest you, this is the place where that happened. And in that sense, it's very spiritual, but, but yeah, uh -huh. I, I, yeah, I'm, I think your assessment is, is spot on about, you know, nothing gives you any greater authority or knowledge by standing there and feeling that it's a wonderful feeling. I, it's fantastic, but I, I don't yeah. doubt it, man. I'm, I'm sure it's a really surreal feeling and I can imagine how surreal it would feel for me, but I'd be standing in Lincoln in the 2020s, not 1878. It's, it's, Absolutely. You know, and there's and no one, 
there's no one there that I could talk to. I mean, you could talk to distant descendants now, but there's no one there who I could talk to who was alive in Bonnie's time. So, mm-hmm. uh, and even then, you might end up speaking with someone who's embellishing and telling you know tall tales because these folks who talk to folks who were alive in Bonnie's time often got wild information. <laughs> but uh, you know, if, if there's any way. Maybe we could get you here by boat sometime and traverse the country and, and get you there. You know, we'll, we'll we'll figure out some way to get you over here. <laughs> oh, well, I, never not never say never. Man. <laughs> that's right. I'd love to hang in Lincoln with you. That'd be cool. Um, but yeah, it's it's it was it's super. It's a very amazing experience. So Tell you Dolph, mentioned the gen- come along. Please. Yeah. Well, yeah, he was supposed to be here this morning, but he said he had some freight to unload, some actual work to do. It's a, a, it's a shame we all. Yeah, he is. He's a trip. <laughs> He's a firebrand. Perhaps another pistol, maybe a, a side pocket pistol. <laughs> yeah, a Derringer. Yes, yes. Yeah. Whereas I'm, I'm, the I'm, a, I'm, I'm a Magnum. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you dirty hairy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Speaking of which, you did an article for True West recently on Django Unchained, uh, Tarantino's film. And along with that, you kind of did an informal campaign with Bob Bose Bell to, to make it a cover piece, right? Yeah. Yeah, so behind that, you know, the, a lot of what the feedback you were getting from people that you would kind of posted on on Facebook and shared the article was that Django is not a Western. And, and for the life of me, man, I, I can't figure out w- what makes disqualifies that as a Western. A lot of folks would say that it takes place in the East. A lot of folks would say it's pre-Civil War. And I can think of other half movies that... that yeah, I can think of movies... <laughs> Right. Yeah, and I can think Quigley's of many there. movies that. Yes. Yeah. yeah, one of my favorites. Quigley, Quigley is one of my yeah, favorites. That's based, here. that's based here in Australia, and that's considered a western. Yeah. So. Yeah. They can. Um. So your point with the article, you know, Django Unchained is the highest grossing western of all time, right? Yes, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. It's and, and I think made it's more a, money. It's one, made more money in its opening week at the box office than Tombstone made throughout its entire run. And I love Tombstone, but... Yeah. Oh, you yeah, know, people were going off about it on the True West page because it's a Tarantino film. I'm like, well, it's not really about Tarantino. It's about right. the, the movie itself. And it was also about some stuff related to how the focus so often seems to be on the old classic Westerns. And as well as, you know, the way some things are done in the field of study that I think could be done a little better. But, you know, the, the response to it was actually primarily positive. There were more, far more positive reactions. It's just that the negative people are the ones that scream the loudest, like little bitches. And, you know, I had some very colourful comments and messages <laughs> directed at me, which I'm not even going to repeat. <laughs> like I said, I had one guy that, you know, well, he made sure that I knew that he had a gun in his hand when he was going off, but uh, which I thought was funny. Eh? Yeah, fuck it, man. <laughs> Go ahead if you can hit me from over there. But uh, yeah, I think. Can it was, you imagine? I, can you imagine being so worked up over an opinion on a movie to actually talk about having a gun in your hand and, and taking action? No, I have um, I have this thing. Uh, it's called a brain. So yeah, and that generally stops me from reacting like a idiot. Oh, that's good. Like that. No, I think your I think the article was really well received, and uh, again, as, as usual, is very well written. And uh, I think you're a great writer, James, and that's a breath of fresh air. Sorry, what? This... Can you say that again. I didn't hear you. You, you cut out. I... <laughs> I said, I think you're a great writer, and... Yeah, I still, I still can't um, hear you, man. Yeah, I said, let me get closer right. to the mic. I, 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 
I said, I Dang. think you're a great... James, is that I'm coming through? With you. Yeah, I'm fucking <laughs> I know. With you. <laughs> I was going along. I was going. Along. I was going to say yeah. it as many times as you needed me to. <laughs> I'm kidding. Now, but yeah. but I know one of your biggest influences is Hunter S. Thompson, right? Yeah, definitely. Who would you say that was like your probably your biggest influence as a writer? Oh, uh, I don't know if I necessarily have a biggest influence as a writer. Right. I write write on instinct. Hunter was an influence to a degree. Um, so was Arthur, Arthur Rimbaud on the T-shirt. Um, I mean, he was a poet, but he definitely yeah. had some influence on me. Uh, but mostly I just try to write. Uh, Sylvia Plath, I adore Sylvia Plath, adore her, massive yeah. crush on her, even though she's been dead for so long. And, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I just... I mainly just write from instinct. I just write as I, I don't want to sound like someone else or write like anyone else. I just I write like me. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, Hunter S. Thompson is definitely a, a, a writer that I absolutely enjoy. That's awesome. Yeah, I think you bring a lot of that uh, honesty and frankness to your work like Hunter S. Thompson did. I mean, there was nothing inauthentic or um, there was no filter to Hunter S. Thompson. And a lot well, of times I think. If I ahead. have been influenced by Hunter, then, then that would probably be it. It would probably be the fearlessness in that I'm not afraid yeah. to write something that might hurt someone's little feelings if it's true. I mean, mm -hmm. I just, you know, because a writer, you know, whenever a writer's, setting out to write an article or a book, their, their first priority should always be, you know, people's feelings. Uh, right. <laughs> so, whatever, yeah. But that, that article, the Django article, we'll wrap it up about that, man, because I'm sure that people listening probably want to hear more about Bonnie, that um, that was a lot of fun for me to write because the creative handcuffs came off. I wasn't writing about strict frontier history. I was writing about pop culture. So I was able to spew that out in a lot of, kind of different manner. That was like a hint. You know, the same, it was very fun for me to you know, write that Nirvana cover story that was published recently. I was writing about music again, something different. I get a little restless sometimes. I have to mix it up a little. Absolutely. Yeah, I was going to mention that, that, you know, I'm sure you experienced that same thing with that Nirvana article. You get to talk about subjective experiences, emotions, ex you know, live music experiences, things like that. It's a lot you can bring to it, and I'm sure it is a, a nice break from the uh, the Bonnie and history industry. Um, one thing I was going to say, uh, you mentioned about historical writing and, and about how no matter where you are, nothing will get you closer to events that happened about 140 years ago. Uh, that being said, that's that's kind of something I think a lot of times when people talk about what happened july 14th 1881 they they say well you know billy had to be in the house because you would never walk down the street without your boots on and regardless because they're like you know there's all kinds of like you know can I, can they I mention just, all the is, is that dan edwards that dipshit you're quoting there no i i just want to point out that hispano women were very well known to be walking around barefoot. You know, I mean, this it's not that big a deal that he didn't have his boots on. I mean, this is a tough little guy. Yeah, Hispana, well, Hispanas walked around barefoot all the time on the same terrain. But anyway, keep going. Yeah, I'm sorry, Dan. Well, oh, no, that's that was my point, though, is that, you know, regardless of how it would be right now to walk in Fort Sumner without your shoes... We don't know how it was when Fort Sumner was a town, a community of folks. You know, you had yeah. a restaurant, you had a uh, some form of, of kind of lodging where travelers would stay. You had a post office, you had uh, the saloon. I mean, these were you frequented these streets. So we just don't know. We don't have a lot of good pictures of Fort Sumner, if any, at, at, at the time exactly contemporary with Bonnie. So we 
we have no idea. And a lot of times most of our history is done and most of our logic about history is done by trying to apply today's logic and today's requirements of living to past times. And yeah, I think that's big, one of the hangups. That's a big no, no for me. You don't, if you're going to write about frontier history, you need to leave your 21st century ideals and moral expectations at the door. Um, yeah. This, this was a very different time. I mean, it, it, if you think about it, I mean, when Bonnie was running around, slavery had only been, you know, become prohibited for like less than two decades. Yeah. You know, this was, yeah, I mean, it's a very different time to what we know now. In regard to Fort Sumner, man, you know, it was actually, it was uh, July 15th that Bonnie actually yep. entered that bedroom at 12.30 on July, in the morning of July 15th. And uh, Pat Garrett plugged it. Yep. So, yeah, this, I think yeah. that for me, oh, but he wasn't wearing his boots. I think that's just looking for something. That's that's not a big deal unless you make it into one. And I But then a lot of people like to do shit like that. Yeah, so, I mean, I think it's anybody who is watching this, most folks will will know. I mean, the, the fact that Billy died that night is, to me, not a question. Um, so I don't really want yeah. to explore the other possibilities. But what do you think about uh, the accounts of Poe and Garrett? Do you think that they, and, and other folks there, do you think that they're trying to... to do you think they're telling the complete truth or do you think they're tweaking things maybe to protect Paulita's reputation or somebody else uh, protect the, the, uh, the source of their tip off or something like that? Do you think they are just 100% straight with their account or do you think they're trying to, to cover something up, you know, however minuscule we may think today? They, weren't being a hundred percent. I think it's pretty clear if you can read between the lines of the history that it was Pedro Maxwell that tipped them off in regards to Bonnie being there. Vicente Otero, who was one of Billy's pallbearers, said that years later. He said uh, Pedro Maxwell didn't want Billy to marry his sister. That's why he told Pat Garrett that Billy was here. And so obviously they were protecting Pedro and I think they were trying to protect maybe Paulita to a degree. I, I, Mm. To, to some degree with that. I think, yeah, so this is where you get into dangerous waters because people will say, oh, well, if they weren't honest about that, maybe they were. <laughs> um, yeah. They weren't 100% honest on everything. I think they both omitted, it's pretty clear they both omitted the fact that they were both too scared to go into the bedroom and let Delavina and his of Silva go in there first. That's clear. I gave a very lengthy footnote as to why that in all probability appears to have been the case in the notes of my book, as I'm sure you read it. Uh, outside of that, the general accounts of how Bonnie came to his death, it's, it's really not that big a deal about it. If, unless you're going looking for a conspiracy, if, you, if you're looking for something to create some fantasy mindset it's it's pretty clear it matches up poe and garrett's accounts aren't that different i mean i think right it's pretty obvious yeah i agree with you uh i think the the discrepancies and the things like that are, are to me clearly just to to protect the source which i agree with you is pedro maxwell and to um possibly protect the reputation of paulita if if you know, I could see them saying, you know, she's about to be married soon. Uh, we don't want her reputation of having, you know, absconded with some outlaw, that kind of thing. Because even, you know, by the time that Walter Noble Burns was writing, I, I don't know why, but at least two sources and maybe other. Well, let's say three, because I'll include Jim East. But these folks seem to dance around Paulita's name. And, you know, Burns interviewed her and in his book, he said it was Selsa. And even though it, he made it quite clear that he he knew it was Paulita and well, later Henry through, Hoyt. Paulita, Paulita threw Selsa under the bus. That's what she did. Yes, she did. Um, <laughs> she did. Uh, 
uh, Walter Noble Burns, uh, he wanted to write the truth, but he couldn't from fear of a lawsuit. Uh, he knew yeah. full well. He even said that uh, Polita's little sister used to openly tell anyone that Bonnie yeah. and her were planning to elope. And wow. So, I mean, you can read that in uh, Dawkins' book about Burns called American Mythmaker. It's all right there. There is actually no evidence whatsoever that Bonnie and Salsa were ever in romantically involved. There really isn't. Right. I mean, all we have is that innuendo from Paulita. Now, was there something that we don't know? Uh, but there's nothing to really demonstrate or certainly not prove that they were involved. But... Uh, right. As I put it all in the book, it, it's pretty clear. And I, I wouldn't say that Jim East danced around Paul Leader's name, and there were others who certainly did. Uh, Martin yeah. Chavez did. Uh, Miguel you know, Antonio Otero did. So. Fair enough. Yeah, I'm not. Honestly, I read Otero's book once, and that was right when I got into it. And have never revisited it. So I, I can't. I couldn't remember what he said. But I know Jim East. When he wrote to Seringo, I believe he said uh, Dulcinea del Toboso, you know, which was a kind of a, a reference to Don Quixote. But um, in his letter to uh, who did he write to? Uh, Judge, I forget his name. I know. Um, I know. Who yeah, it, it starts with an H. But he says, uh, you know, that Delavina came and Luce and Paulita and all that. So. We have enough sources, I think, to de you know be fairly confident that Paulita was really Jim, Jim East Billy's described love it openly. Jim Jim East yeah. vividly recalled watching Paulita stick her tongue down Billy's throat. Um, <laughs> yeah. So if, if they weren't romantically involved, they had a very strange way of saying goodbye. Uh, the whole the whole world loves a lover, like he said. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, one of Pat Garrett's posse men, Lou Bowsman, he said it. He said Billy was stuck on. Maxwell's sister. Maxwell didn't want him. Mm. Uh, so he talked yeah. about it. Uh, Pat Garrett said, Pat Garrett literally said in an interview with the newspaper years later, he said that there was no point chasing after Bonnie, you know, with that head start, etc. It was better for me to wait until I got him at his sweetheart's place at the Maxwell house. And, I mean, that was the quote, actually. Give me a second here. The quote is right here in the book. I'll read it verbatim. This is what Pat Garrett said in an interview with the newspaper. There was no use chasing him in that country with the start he had. I waited until I thought he would reach his sweethearts at the Maxwell Ranch House, and I got him. Those are Pat okay. Garrett's words. Now, he just said his sweethearts at the Maxwell Ranch House, and that's Pat Garrett. Yeah. So, what more do you want? Now, and, and there's another one of those little discrepancies because... Poe says that Garrett was even reluctant to swing by Maxwell's. And I don't, I don't doubt know. that he was. I, I, Pat was fr Pat was Pat was nervy. Pat Garrett himself openly admitted that later that he was shit scared. That he was yeah, right. Yeah. He, he said, Yeah, damn right I was. Uh, Pat was a <laughs> big guy and he made for a very inviting target. Bonnie had nothing yeah. to lose, and if Bonnie had spotted Pat snooping around, there's no question how the kid would have tried to deal with it. Right. So I don't doubt and, John W. Poe on that at all. Yeah. So you think, you know, by the time Pat gave that interview, he's making it look like they, you know, that he was there on in, intentionally and not, you know, not nervous at all and was like, I went there and got him. But, uh, you know, those well, are the I kind mean, of things that... that is what happened. That is what happened. Yeah. He, he did go to the Maxwell house, but, I mean, he's not going to tell the newspaper, well, I was shit scared, but I went anyway. Um, exactly. But that's – I think that's where the conspiracy yeah. theorists kind of were like, oh, there's something going on there. It's like, no, he's a human being. At the time, yeah. he was scared shitless, and now he he's openly admitted retro – yeah, he's retconning it and saying, like, I was brave and went there and we knew what we were doing, obviously, because you don't want to, you know – always say that you didn't know what you were doing and you were scared shitless. So, yeah. um, but I, I, that's one of the things there's so many aspects to just this part of the story that I think illustrates so well who these people were and are and, uh, and everything and, and just cool little anecdotes. And the fact that 
you know, people are like, well, you don't think Billy would have gone in there, you know, and and shot someone. It's like, look, this shows a lot about who Billy was because he's not going to go in there and shoot somebody he doesn't know. He's going to make sure it's not a friend of Pete's. He's going he's gonna to use his head. Yeah, he's all he knew at the time. That could have been Paul Leader. Right. In the room. Yeah. Paul Leader could have been in the room for all he knew. Was well, he supposed to go in there and just get start like Joe Pesci and just start banging, yeah. banging, banging all over the place? <laughs> I mean, come on. I know, the fact yeah, was, he's he, not... it was the middle of the night. It was 12.30 in the morning. And look, the kid was human. It's it's like this bullshit about, uh, you know, spinning the cylinder of Joe Grant's gun. Look, Paco right. and Naya, however you want to feel about his account, he was in Fort Sumner. He didn't remember any of that happening. In all probably Grant's gun misfired. That's what, mm. you know, if, if it hadn't misfired, he would have shot by him. You know, he wasn't a superhero. He wasn't a Jedi. He wasn't, you know, he made mistakes. It was 12.30 at night. He was hungry. He was hot. He was tired. He went up to the Maxwell house. He spotted a couple of guys on the porch, like, hey, who are you? Went into the bedroom to ask Pete, hey, who are those fellas? And he didn't know Pat Garrett just happened to be sitting in there on the bed. Pat Garrett shot and got him once right in the chest. Billy fell what a forward story. flat onto his plate. And there's really not – people say, oh, it doesn't add up. I'm like, well, actually, it does, unless you you don't want it to add up because you'd prefer yes. to stick to the narrative you've created in your mind. So, Well, yeah, it doesn't add up if you're trying to follow a story, one that yeah, – I've always said, you know, humans – there's a reason we write books and that we make movies and that we tell tales. We've been doing it since we sat around campfires, you know, and, and pre – civilized time so to speak there's a reason that we tell stories and reality does not always turn out like a story and that drives us crazy and so that's why it doesn't add up because we want it to make sense wrote, and it doesn't make sense i wrote in the note in the notations of my book in all my years of you know and i go back a long way to like the early 2000s i was commenting a lot on Lucas Spears' discussion board. I mean, that's you know, that's how it was a discussion board. Yeah. Who uses them in? And that right. was back in 2000. In, in like the 20 plus years, I've never once spoken to a single claimant theorist who does not twist the narrative, twist the evidence to fit their narrative, as opposed to letting their narrative be determined by the evidence. And... Yeah. Every single claimant argument I've ever heard is filled with ifs, maybes, what if Billy, oh, what if this happened? If you need that many ifs and maybes in your argument, you don't actually have an argument. You just have yeah. speculation. And also the don't you thinks. The, the thing, like, don't you yeah. think that if Billy was like this, it would do this? And you're telling me that two lawmen who went there and did this would actually, and, and those that's all speculation, and yes, Things that don't make sense and disorganized events and chaos happens in real life. Yeah, logically, there's a lot of things that shouldn't happen, but that do just because they do. And, and that's because the thing Pat about Garrett, record keeping. Know, it's perfectly what logical it? that Pat Garrett, after unsuccessfully trying to sh shoot Bonnie at Stinking Spring, would on a whim all of a sudden decide, you know what, I'm going to trust the kid to leave and never, ever come back. Because, you know, if he happens to show up again, I'm screwed. I'm going to be right. outcast. And, yeah, that makes total fucking sense. Yeah. And I'm not a guy who cares anyway, about my reputation at all. <laughs> yeah, no, I, to hell with my political ambitions. To hell with the fact that I'll probably have to leave the United States of America if I got exposed as a charlatan who faked the death of the most famous <laughs> outlaw in the history of the Southwest. The hell yeah. with all that. I'll just all of a sudden trust that Billy will stay away. This incredibly stubborn little shit who went back to Fort Sumner after he killed Ollinger and Bill. Yeah, it makes right. total sense. Yeah. So tell me about your new book that you just said you just finished, which is exciting because I, I look forward to reading it. So um, what is what is your new book? It's called In the Days of Billy the Kid. The Lives and Times of Jose Chavez y Chavez, Juan Patron, Martin Chavez, and Nino Salazar. That's what it's called. And it is a history that is centered around their lives. So it actually begins in the 
uh, you'd say, 1850s, early 1850s, and the narrative, it stretches right to the 1930s. So, uh, yeah, and yeah. it's predominantly always the focus was to really tell not just the Lincoln County War, it goes far beyond that. I mean, Billy doesn't actually come into it to Chapter 5, and he gets killed halfway through. There's a lot mm -hmm. more history of uh, Los Barras Blancas, La Sociedad de Bandidos de Nuevo Mexico, uh, yeah. all the stuff that Jose Chavez, Chavez was involved in, the fact that he went to prison. Uh, that, and, of course, he was – well, he wasn't pardoned, actually. He was paroled, as you will read in the book. There's a difference. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, so it stretches right through that history. It's centred around their lives. It also covers the Herrera brothers and Vicente Silva and some other – some other outlaws, like some you probably may not have heard of, like um, Porfirio Trujillo, and uh, who did four stints in the penitentiary. Talk about a perennial jail. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of lot of uh, fascinating Hispano history that has really been untapped, and it's focuses on the Hispano side of things right all the way through as much as humanly possible. Obviously, when I'm writing about Lincoln County, well, Billy does get his own kind of chapter at one point, uh, but and when you're writing about Lincoln County War, because it was centred around Anglo participants, you know, McSween, Tunstall, yeah, you have to veer off. But my eye was always on the Hispano side of things, their perspective, as much as humanly possible. I'm I'm super excited for that book because that Untapped is almost like an. Uh... Uh, understatement, if that's a word. I'm having a weird acid flashback right now. But it, it's, it's that's week. subtle. <laughs> that's it's subtle to say untapped because the the you know Hispanic narratives and the the whole world, you know, it was a it was a Hispanic world, and yeah, those stories have been largely ignored. Like the whole the whole Silva gang stuff, you know, that Chavez was involved in, just. These stories are amazing and and just rich yeah. and horrible in some respects, but like they oh, are. Yeah. Un, there's no book about them, you know. And uh, well, there's, it just there's, blows. there's been a couple. There was one book about the uh, one book about Vicente Silva. There's been a couple actually. There was one that was published in 1896, Bacabeza de Barca. It was a very kind of an authentic life kind of book, but it, there was when researching you know, from documents and other stuff like that. A lot of history actually matches up. He was a pretty good historian for his time. And there's, but there's mm. been very, very little generally on it. And I think a lot of people, even long-time Lincoln County War aficionados, are going to be stunned at the revelations about these guys. I really look forward to this book. I think there's going to be a lot of, you know, unknown material to most of us that, that we're going to enjoy reading. And uh, now you said you finished it last night. No, I finished it the other night. I'm still the other night. I, when I say I finished it, I finished the introduction, the pro the prologue, the chapters, and the epilogue. I'm still fully furnishing the notes and the bibliography and going through tightening where I can edit stuff like that. But I'll have it to my publisher by the end of this month. So, and yeah. what what kind of timeline do you think we're looking at for release? Like. 2024 uh at all according to my publisher it's going to be it's going to be early spring 2025 which i'm not overly thrilled mm. about i would have preferred it to come out next your autumn next year but yeah yeah it's the way it goes the publishing process sometimes it takes more than a year so yeah and, and, and ideally you know if the cards fall right maybe it'll be sooner but that's just unfortunately this stuff takes a long time usually so that's okay you can uh send the unpublished manuscript to me for review whenever you want. <laughs> uh, keep dreaming. Oh, All yeah. these fascinating lives, man, that, that are just unexplored. Uh, it's just, it's amazing. What do you think about uh, George Coe in frontier fighter when he goes to visit Salazar and his wife pulls that's out an there. old picture of, she pulls out an old picture yeah. of Billy. Do you think that's a, just a reprint of the tintype or do you think that that's uh yeah. You know, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. If, too. It, if that had been, if that had been a, a, you know, if anyone would have had another photo of Bonnie, I expect it might have been you know, Salazar. If that had been another right. photo, I'm sure we would have put it by now. I'd say it was just a copy yeah. of the tin type. 
There's a photo of Paco Anaya holding up a, a copy of the tin type in Fort Sumner on the yeah. 50th anniversary of Orange Yeah. So I'd say that's that's what it was. But yeah, that little uh, visit from Co. That that's in the book. That's in there as well. And uh, that's great. People say there's nothing new to learn. It's it's unreal. You know, one thing that's always fascinated me was uh, I'll, we'll talk about this real quick and I'll wrap it up. But the the account of Francisco Trujillo uh, when he talks yeah. about uh, you know riding with the regulators and, the, and them killing. I assume he talks about killing. Uh, the Indian Manuel Segovia, but he calls him Jesus yep. Armijo, uh, and and that's yeah. not really. Do you think? Do you think that really happened? I mean, that's not talked about a lot by anyone. I wrote about Kelly. it in the book, and I used I, yeah, I used yeah. Trujillo as the name of course. Uh, he got Pico. the name wrong, so <laughs> what? Yeah, well, that was his nickname, Pico. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah but I mean, at that time, he got he got so many names wrong. It's it, you have to really. Yeah, figure that out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not hard to figure out. It's just you know people misremember names. So, my brother, who's in his you know, he's pushing sixty. You know, I mean, he forgot my nephew's girlfriend's name for an hour. Once. He couldn't remember, <laughs> and she lived with him. She lived with him, right? So, so, yeah, you know. yeah. But I mean, that's one of the coolest stories about you know Doc trading the saddles and and all this stuff, and it's just not included in a lot of discussions about the activities yeah, of the regulators cool, and everything. Very cool. So yeah, yeah I, I knew you. And, and um, as, me, as much of the Espano side of things that, that are reasonable. I mean, if, if I came across the Espano account, it's just obviously ridiculous. Then sure. Yeah. That got yeah, no, but any, you know, I couldn't ignore Trujillo's account because, you know, yeah, it's pretty extensive, and and Trujillo says that McSween was in on the Brady killing too. I I mention that sort of in the book, but I say, look, however accurate that was, we don't know. Right. Um, yeah. Trujillo is the only one who ever said that, so I personally yeah. am not convinced. I'm not convinced well, that, that Dick Brewer didn't know anything about it. Um, that's. Yeah, he you've, definitely. You've got to remember you know, there, again. That, that's people nowadays trying to, to to sort of put a spin on it. It's like, well, as far as the regulators were concerned, they were totally justified. You know, yeah. as far as they felt, Brady was in on Tunstall's murder, so to hell with him. And yeah. it was a case of, to quote Young Guns, reap the whirlwind. Yep. Different times, different, you know. Yeah. I do think that Brewer seemed more level-headed and would probably not have gone for the Brady shooting, but McSween definitely, you know, Mc, McSween knew how to play political hardball, and he, I, I just don't see I, him uh, doing that. I, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that Dick Brewer was necessarily involved. I'm just saying I find it very hard to believe for him to have not known that it was in the cards. Right I, right, I get the impression that Brewer went back to his ranch because he knew what was going to, what the other guys were going <laughs> to do. Right, and he yeah. went back to Rio Rodolfo to distance himself from it because this is a guy yeah. who also almost immediately after Brady was killed, what did what did Dick Brewer do immediately after Brady was shot? He took over the regulators again. He was back leading them, so yeah. it wasn't like, oh, what have you done? I'm out of here. True. So much of that is, you know. You really you wish you had a fucking time machine to go know, back and man. ask him. I mean, we, we still know we know so little about John Chisholm's direct involvement in the Linton County War. So yeah. little about he was a player, but we don't really know how involved he was. What he may have said to the regulators. Obviously, Bonnie and Jose Chavez e. Chavez touched on this, and John Middleton kind of hinted at it. Bonnie firmly stated that the Chisholm owed him money for the Lincoln County. So again, Chisholm's involvement is still very murky. There's more to be found there, I think, if it's possible to find. It. You know, some things in history just aren't meant to be Unreal. uncovered, unfortunately. Unfortunately. I appreciate you coming on. I've I've really enjoyed this. It was good to talk to you voice to voice instead of uh messenger to messenger. <laughs> We really should have done that sooner as, as long as we've been talking. Um, but, uh, yeah. we will, we will get you back on here. Uh, 
one last plug for your book, if you want to hold it up, Billy the Kid, El Bandito, Simpatico. Uh, Shameless there it fun is. time. There it is. Yes. Dead by the fucking <laughs> and your new one uh, is coming out. Yeah. That- well, rel- I think we can say soon, even if it's a year from now. That's relatively soon in the publishing world. So we will definitely be on the yeah. lookout for it. You got any uh, articles planned or anything like that? Anything in the works? Uh, there's supposed to be an article coming out at some point with True West that I wrote about the Johnny Depp Western Dead Man. Uh, that's nice. that's waiting in the wings. Um, outside of that, man, I, mean, I just had that Grizzlies article published in the December True West. So, I mean, they did an article with me yeah. two issues in a row. So I expect they'll give me there a you break go. now. Yeah. Well, it's, you probably uh, need a break after yeah. finishing the, the book. Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. Well, we will uh, call yeah. this and... We will uh, plan another one. Thanks for joining me, dude. No worries, man. We need to get we need to get Doss on next time. Man. Seriously, that'd be good fun. You let's get him on. Maybe he'll uh, he'll have yeah. to schedule a day off work or something. No worries, man. Cool, dude. Good talking to you. You too. I'm gonna go, go get pass some, out. Yeah, go get some sleep. <laughs> yeah. See fun. you, man. <laughs> Bye, Catch you, buddy.